the federal government can see which videos you are watching on YouTube. Perhaps this doesn't come as a surprise to some people after years of evidence that the FBI is spying on ordinary conservatives, Republican campaign workers, Catholics who go to the Latin Mass, and on and on. But now we know for certain. According to a new report in Forbes, federal authorities asked Google for the names, addresses, phone numbers, and user activity of accounts that watched certain YouTube videos in early January of last year. And if you think watching YouTube without logging in will protect you, you are wrong. The feds also reportedly ordered Google to hand over the IP addresses of viewers who were not logged in. The government is defending the spying on the grounds that they are investigating a money laundering operation linked to certain videos. But those videos had tens of thousands of views. All but one, a handful at most, of those viewers had nothing to do with the alleged crime that was being investigated. The rest are being spied on just because, just because they can. The reporting is bad enough. But if the federal government currently has this power with Google in cahoots, knowing what we know about surveillance of the American right, does anyone doubt that they can get and very likely have gotten identifying information about all sorts of other political enemies? If you are watching this show on YouTube right now, well, see you in the gulag. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. Wayne Brady explains pansexualism, pangenderism, pansexuality uh, to People Magazine. You're not going to want to miss that important take on uh, human nature and psychology. Uh, that is coming up. First, though, you got to check out Hallow. We are in the midst of Lent, the 40 days leading up to Easter. Many Christians are choosing to give up booze, social media, and other distractions to focus more on prayer, fasting, and giving. Hallow's annual Pray 40 Challenge is one of their most popular. This year, there are over 1 million people praying as part of the challenge. The Pray 40 Challenge focuses on surrender and includes meditations on the powerful book, He Leadeth Me, by Father Walter Chiswick. The series follows Father Chiswick, an American priest and missionary, through his imprisonment and subsequent enslavement in the Soviet Union during World War II and the Cold War. His story is one of ultimate surrender, and participants in the challenge are called to surrender their worries, anxieties, problems, and lives to God. Our very own Dr. Jordan Peterson's wife, Tammy, was recently featured in Pray 40, where she shares her story about being diagnosed with terminal cancer and how she surrendered her fears to God. The Hallow app is transformative, will help you connect with your faith on a deeper level. So what are you waiting for? Join Hallow's Pray 40 Challenge today. Download the Hallow app at hallow.com slash Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S. You will receive an exclusive three-month free trial and hear Tammy Peterson's story of faith. Hallow.com slash Knowles. We are now in Holy Week. Lent is coming to an end. That means that the Smells and Bells candle is coming to an end. You got to go to dailywire.com slash shop after Easter. They're gone. This is our best-selling candle ever. The, the other important thing to remember about Holy Week, I was thinking this when I was at Palm Sunday Mass, and at Palm Sunday they read the Passion narrative. You know, our Lord's uh, arrest and trial and uh, then uh, flagellation and persecution and uh, finally the crucifixion. The one thing I remembered, an observation I made over the years, is that the devil works overtime during Holy Week. Things just start to go wrong. Temptations get a little tougher. It just, it just happens. It's, it's uh, like clockwork, it seems. Uh, so watch out. Pray that ye be not led into temptation. It definitely can happen. Uh, and then Easter is upon us. So we will you know, have quite a lot to look forward to. In political news, President Trump has a lot to look forward to because he might just be about to make a lot of money. And the reason for this is Truth Social, Trump's Twitter alternative, might imminently be about to go public. Right now, Truth Social is a private company founded by Trump. Uh, it could go public as soon as this week. Uh, shareholders on Friday voted to approve a merger with a shell company. So the way that 
Truth Social could go public is through a, a SPAC, a special purpose acquisition company, which is just a, a shell company that raises money without any underlying substance to the company. The whole point of the shell company is just to acquire some other company. And so one of the advantages to going public through a SPAC is that it can happen very quickly. The the traditional process of an IPO and of, of a company going public can take a very, very long time. Uh, this could happen very, very quickly. The deal could provide Trump media with more than $300 million. That's an interesting number because we know right now that uh, the civil fraud judgment against Trump in New York that he says he doesn't have the cash for started out as being $300 million and change. Now, with all the interest that the New York Attorney General has added on, it's about four, $450 million. Uh, but a windfall like this could be very helpful for Trump being able to maintain some of his other properties to keep the New York Democrats from stealing Trump Tower or one of the other Trump buildings. Based on the current share price of the shell company that could acquire Trump's Truth Social, uh, the, 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 the boost to Trump's net worth could be like $3 billion. It could be insane. Because right now, the shell company is trading at nearly 42 bucks a share, meaning Trump media, what, what this whole new corporation will become, would, would hit the marketplace with a value of around 5 billion dollars, and Trump owns 60% of the company. So that's a ton of numbers, but how is this possible? You're probably wondering how a, a social media platform that very few people use other than President Trump, Truth Social is effectively a, a platform for him to release press releases, pseudo-tweets that then other people post around on the other social media platforms. How could that possibly be worth $5 billion? Well, the explanation is is that it's kind of like a meme stock. You remember a year or two ago when uh, people on the internet were just boosting the price of stocks that didn't seem super valuable, like GameStop, for instance, and they just shoot it through the roof? Something like that appears to be going on here. And in, in this case, it, it's probably even more reflective of the, the will of the public because Trump is the leading candidate for president right now. Not only is he the Republican nominee, but he's just the leading candidate. He's just, he's doing much better than Biden. So all of that to say, just when you think this guy is out, just when you think the libs have finally got him now, it's Mueller time, baby. They're going to impeach him. It's Russia Gate. It's Ukraine Gate. It, they're going to put him in jail. They're going to take his property. Just th the man cannot be put in a corner. Well, he's going to owe $400 million. There's no way that he could. Oh, wait a second. He just, money just fell out of the sky. He probably can't sell his shares in this company anytime soon because he's the, the chief investor. Is the chief shareholder. So, you know, if all of a sudden the thing goes public and then he dumps all the shares, that's going to tank the stock price. But nevertheless, Trump might have pulled a rabbit out of a hat again. And the libs are very, very upset about this. The, the other most important legal maneuver for Trump right now is for the Supreme Court to acknowledge that he has legal immunity for any supposed crimes that he committed while executing his duties as president of the United States. Uh, if, if the Supreme Court rules that he doesn't have immunity, then they're going to get him for jaywalking when he was president. Oh, he walked across Pennsylvania Avenue and he didn't look both ways and the light was blinking. It wasn't totally red yet, but he real you know, at least that should send him to jail for 500 years, right? Uh, the liberals in the Democrat Party and in the Republican Party, I'm talking about the Liz Cheney and the Adam Kinzinger types, they are furious at the prospect that the, the court might say that the president obviously has certain legal immunities. Uh, Kinzinger goes on CNN, talks to Anderson Cooper, says that if the Supreme Court recognizes this fact, democracy's over. Oh, there's a lot at stake. I mean, not just in, in terms of what it means for this election. I mean, obviously, if the Supreme Court comes back with what they expect, we expect and say, you don't have absolute immunity, uh, then potentially this trial will proceed. But it has a huge deal of at stake if they come back and say there is such thing as unlimited immunity. I, I don't see how the presidency and frankly, how democracy can continue if you have a bad actor in place that literally can get away with anything 
so long as he or she has the title of president in front of their name. And uh, so this is a very important thing for the Supreme Court to take up. It may be why they decided to take this up after the uh, after the appellate court, but um, they're going to have to make their stamp. And hopefully it comes out 9-0, potentially 8-1, but it's going to be a resounding defeat for Trump, I think. A yeah, resounding defeat for Trump. Okay, well, Adam Kinzinger's uh, powers of prophecy have not proven all that um, effective in the past. So we'll see how he turns out on his prediction. As for his claim, though, he obviously doesn't understand the meaning of democracy. Doesn't understand much about the role of the American presidency. But but let's say that he's referring to just the American constitutional system, saying if Trump is granted legal immunity to execute his duties while in office, then the American constitutional system will collapse. Not only is Kinzinger wrong, as he frequently is, he's perfectly wrong. He's totally wrong. The the reality is the opposite of what Adam Kinzinger says, which also, I guess, frequently occurs. One of the greatest aspects of the American constitutional system is that we don't throw our vanquished leaders into prison. Not because they don't deserve it. Some of them do deserve it. Not, and some of them deserve it a lot more than Trump does, that's for sure. But the reason that that's a great aspect of our system is because it affords us stability. It encourages people who are talented and in some cases even virtuous to run for higher office. It, it, uh, it, it separates us from banana republics, okay, from tin pot dictatorships. If we deny that, if we now say, no, actually, if you're in office and then the other party wins after you leave office and you did anything even remotely wrong, don't forget, you could indict a ham sandwich in the United States. If any of that happens, you're going to prison for the rest of your life. And the government's going to take all your stuff. And I don't know, they're going to ship your kids off to the gulag. If we establish that as a precedent, that will upend the American constitutional order. Nobody worth his salt will ever run for office again. I'm not sure that anyone, very few people do these days. Uh, it, w- it would be a disaster. But of course, the, the, the people who are always making these hysterical and histrionic claims about the upending of history and legal precedent, and they're the ones who know nothing about either. Now, we need to hire better people for Congress and for cable news uh guests and political commentators. When you want to hire good people for your company, you got to check out ZipRecruiter. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Knowles. We are all familiar with how difficult hiring can be. Unfortunately, many businesses have been down on their luck trying to find top talent. Fortunately, if you're a business owner or hiring manager, you do not need luck to find top talent for your team. You need ZipRecruiter. Right now, you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S. ZipRecruiter's user-friendly technology guides you to finding top talent. When you post your job, ZipRecruiter's intuitive matching technology presents you with a list of qualified candidates. Once you've reviewed your list of qualified candidates, you can swiftly invite your top choices to apply. This streamlined process encourages them to apply sooner, allowing you to fill that role faster. Aren't you curious to see how ZipRecruiter can help you? Right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Knowles. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within one day. Once again, you go to that exclusive web address to try ZipRecruiter for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash Knowles. ZipRecruiter.com slash Knowles. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Now, getting back to videos that you might watch online. I hope you don't watch them online, but, you know, statistically, some people listening will. There is a former teacher that has just lost another job after employers have discovered her OnlyFans account, her, you know, self-run porn page. I have instructed my producers, by the way, not to include any pictures of her or anything like that because I don't want to inadvertently advertise her her new business or her name or anything like that. as I mentioned, it's Holy Week. Temptations maybe get a little, little more intense as the devil works over time. Uh, but I really wanted to cover this story because it, it has a little bit to do with weird sex stuff and, and modern culture, but it also gets to just a basic truth about human nature, which is 
you can't live multiple lives at the same time. You can't compartmentalize different aspects of your life. You can't alienate yourself from yourself and expect to flourish. It's not possible. You are a person. And and modern liberal society says that what you do in private has nothing to do with the public. And modern liberal society says, really modern, really liberal society says that, you know, you can wake up in the morning and be a, a woman until about noon, and then you can be a man from noon to two, and then you can be all the genders. We'll get to Wayne Brady in just a second, if from two o'clock to five o'clock, and, but it's not possible. You're just you. You're just a person. So this woman, she is 28 years old. So sad. She's so young, and she's, she's falling into so much scandal. She's a teacher in Missouri. She was a, a teacher. Apparently, it came out, you know, I'm sure some of her students might have been poking around the internet. And uh, she resigned. Maybe it it was one of the parents in the district. Uh, But in any case, she resigned. She focused on her OnlyFans career. But apparently OnlyFans wasn't going all that well because she tried to get another job. She tried to get a job as a community support specialist at Compass Health. And uh, she was fired after less than a week. Why was she fired? Unless she was really bad at, you know, fixing the copy machine or something. It's obviously because someone there finally looked her up and realized that she was a porn star. And I feel bad for this woman because she can't get a regular job. She can't do it. She might be able to if she came out and said, okay, I'm not doing porn anymore and I regret it and here's why I discourage people from doing it. You know, if she had a real change of heart, some real repentance, I'm sure she could get another job. But so long as she tries to be a normal, ordinary, well-adjusted person by day and a, a prostitute by night, it's not it's not going to work. You cannot compartmentalize your life. And I have a a reasonable degree of pity and sympathy for young women who are falling into these problems, not just OnlyFans or porn, but, but all of the pitfalls of the sexual revolution and feminism. The notion that you should put off getting married, put off having kids, you should go sleep around with a million guys, you should go work in the widget factory for Mr. McGillicuddy until you're barren or what. I have a great deal of sympathy and pity for these women because they've been told this all their lives. And another lie that they've been told all their lives is this even more fundamental lie that you can be multiple people. That's what a schizophrenic society says. You can just be multiple people. Frankly, this is one of the dangers of, of making an idol out of pluralism where you don't you don't take any of your commitments too seriously. You don't take any of the priorities of obligation and charity too seriously. You say, yeah, man, you know, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. I'm all things to all people at all times. Well, no, you're not. You're not really. And if you if you don't have a grounding in a, a, a basic sense of who you are, your identity, your integrity, the moral order, how to, how to discern between right and wrong and why you ought to choose right over wrong, then when you are interacting with your multiple obligations to trying to persuade multiple people in that sense, being all things to all men, uh, you're, you're going to lose yourself. You're going to lose your identity and you're not going to succeed at anything. Don't fall for it. Now, speaking of full on weird sex stuff, Wayne Brady, I'd forgotten this until this headline trended over the weekend. Wayne Brady, the guy from whose line is it anyway? And just a popular comedian and, and musician too. He came out as pansexual a few years ago. Wayne Brady had been married. I I always thought he was, like he was married to two women or something like that. You know, he had, uh, even though, frankly, you know, we've we've had all sorts of conversations about divorce and marriage, and I I actually don't think it's possible to be married to multiple people, but that's a conversation for another time. I had a long debate with uh, Pearl Davis about this, which is available on my YouTube channel. In any case, the guy always seemed relatively straight by showbiz standards. And then he came out and he said, no, I'm not only am I not straight, I'm not even gay. I'm not even bisexual. I'm pansexual. And no one knows what that is. So Wayne Brady just explained it in an exclusive to People magazine. What do you feel like has been the biggest misconception about what it means to identify as pansexual? And a lot of people, that's a foreign term to them, even amongst, you know, queer people. Yeah. So for you, what has been like the biggest misconception as you've encountered people since you've come out? It was, it, I had to do research and find out what it was that I was feeling. Yeah, I think the biggest misconception, and I, and I even make a joke about it on stay, stage tonight, is that 
is that uh, they, they people think that you're an indecisive bisexual. It's like, no, 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 no. Let me set you straight. What, what the definition basically boils, boils down to is regardless of gender, regardless. So that means that I am happily free to fall in love with anybody here. If you're gay, if you're straight, if you're non-binary, trans, I don't care. It's the person, which in my mind is the ultimate in acceptance and loving. So I win. So I win. <laughs> I win. I'm the most liberal. I'm the most open-minded. I win is what it boils down to. I think for a lot of people, all the weird sex madness does boil down to, I want to win. I want to be the, the best. I want to be the most open-minded. I want to have the most options. I want to be the most free man and the most liberated. And so that means eschewing terms like straight or gay. It means eschewing even terms like bisexual, because bisexual implies that there are two sexes, and you're not allowed to say that anymore. No, I'm... It means eschewing terms like trans and cis. Cis is... Uh, as the late great Norm Macdonald said, cis is a term to uh, marginalize normal people. <laughs> it means you, you uh, know what sex you are and you accept it. Uh, it. means I'm totally open, man. But of course, there's an a anthropological error. There are many, but, but one that is less often discussed here that he's talking about is he says, I don't care if you're a man or a woman, if you're straight or gay, if you're trans or not trans, if you're this or that, I just care about the person. This is one of these really insidious errors of modernity. The notion that your true self has nothing to do with what you look like, where you come from, any of your attributes, or what you do, your habits, your virtues, your vices, your inclinations, your desires, your and that's not really you. Those are all just accidents. Your your sex, your race, your geography, your behavior, your all of that's just that's not I want the real person, man. You've by by denying the importance of all of those attributes, you have just erased the person. What else is a person? What makes up his personality? It's so all those things and a whole host of other things. But, but what, what this project of liberation specifically focused on the sexual revolution always comes down to is a fundamental lie, a tragic deceit, which is in an effort to liberate the person, to liberate the individual by denying the importance of all these characteristics of the individual, you totally abolish the individual. When you dig down deep enough and you, you throw off all of the supposed detritus, you know, you throw off all of the, the supposedly irrelevant facts about this person, you've just torn the person apart. There's no person left to love. And you don't win in that case. Now, in my series, Michael and I have hosted a variety of gripping conversations and debates. And I always look really handsome. And I, whoever wrote this copy today needs a raise. This is really good stuff. So uh, we've had a long conversation with my friend Father Rehill, an exorcist, has something like 5 million views. Highly recommend you check it out. Uh, we have interviewed uh, Jacob Chansley from the, you know, the horn hat guy from January 6th, really interesting guy, all these hours long conversations. Well, one of the most requested topics was to interview someone from the red pill movement. And we invited uh, one or two people, I think, to sit down. And uh, then the last minute, they didn't want to sit down. <laughs> and they sort of, it's kind of funny because they're all really macho and everything, but then they wouldn't actually come and have a conversation. But uh, the one who did, ironically, is a woman named Pearl Davis. So we had a debate about marriage, sat down with Pearl for something like two hours, probably I think more than two hours. Here's a little taste. But I'll see guys that, that take you guys' advice. And it, sometimes, you know, it ruins their life. What, what would men do if they begged you for advice? Again, I'm not in the business of telling men what to do, you know. But I think you kind of are. Well, what percent of women do you think are marriageable? I think you're skirting the issue. 
people are not going to return to marriage until you make the institution more fair. Well, what they'll do is they'll return. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what I say. You guys have been preaching marriage for a decade. And the rates of marriage have still been going down. Why? Because the cost is too high and the quality of women is too low. How do you fix it? Do you want to get married? The full episode is now available on the Michael Knowles YouTube channel and my X channel. Not my personal X channel. It's the Michael Knowles Show X channel, which the Michael Knowles X channel retweets. That's a lot. It's kind of like Truth Social with the shell companies. You know, there's shells of shells of shells. Anyway, you can watch it all over there. Or if you are a member at Daily Wire Plus, head on over there. Go over to Daily Wire Plus right now. Check it out. Speaking of women, turning to somewhat more traditional women, there has been a major tabloid scandal, which is that Catherine, the Princess of Wales, has been missing since January. Uh, she, This is the future Queen of England, Prince William's wife. Uh, she was said to have had abdominal surgery, but then she just kind of disappeared. And there were theories that <laughs> Uh, William was fathering children out of wedlock or something. Again, no evidence for any of this whatsoever. Uh, someone said she was dead and there was a, like a body double or something. People were coming up with all sorts. Uh, pretty soon they're going to say, you know, she's uh, identified as pansexual and she's doing a roadshow with Wayne Brady. Well, the, the gossip and the uh, guessing game can all be over now because the Princess of Wales has come out and explained why she's been out of sight. And it poses a real uh, risk, not, not just to their family, but to the British monarchy. I wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you personally for all the wonderful messages of support and for your understanding whilst I've been recovering from surgery. It has been an incredibly tough couple of months for our entire family, but I've had a fantastic medical team who have taken great care of me, for which I'm so grateful. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London, and at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. My medical team therefore advised that I should undergo a course of preventative chemotherapy, and I'm now in the early stages of that treatment. This, of course, came as a huge shock and William and I have been doing everything we can to process and manage this privately for the sake of our young family. So there are still going to be all sorts of theories. about This, to me, seems uh, to explain it, because apparently the kids were ending their school term before the Easter recess, and so they wanted to wait to tell the kids first so that there wouldn't be a media firestorm that the future Queen of England has cancer at the same time that the current King of England, King Charles, has cancer, And obviously, this puts a lot of pressure on Prince William. There are going to be some Americans out there who say, well, who cares? Who cares about these people? I haven't cared about these people since 1776. First of all, I care just because she seems like a lovely woman. She's a very dignified woman. And we should all pray for her and for her recovery and and, uh, for Charles too, King Charles. Uh, But why? Why do Americans care? They do care. This has been trending all over American tabloids too. It's not just the British tabloids. Why? Why... Why does monarchy, or aspects of monarchy at least, endure throughout history? We kid ourselves in the United States. We say, we got rid of the monarchy. Oh, did we? Because I was just at the State of the Union two weeks ago, and there was a lot of pomp and circumstance over there. I'm not saying that the the American president is a king, though we have had American presidents who effectively have been kings. Notably, Franklin Roosevelt was the American monarch. The guy reigned for four terms, died in office. Good luck trying to distinguish, just on pure aesthetics, to distinguish Franklin Roosevelt from any of the supposedly autocratic leaders of his age or even from a proper monarch. Why is that? Why is that enduring? Because we live in society. That's what politics is. And we need representatives. Even in democracy, we need representatives. That's why we call our system of government a representative democracy. But we also have one particular representative in the United States, which is the president. People don't get really all that jazzed about their congressmen. People don't really get all that jazzed about their senators. But people get really fired up about 
their presidential candidates and their presidents. Because we, it's just human nature. We just, we care about people. You know, we're a mimetic animal. We imitate people. We, we cultivate and, and, and form our desires based on the desires of other people. And we follow leaders. That's just how it works. And uh, so the, the monarchy in the United Kingdom has been a huge plus for them. And uh, one of the problems with the monarchy is that a lot, there are a lot of dodgy characters in it, like Prince William who's gallivanting with, uh, Je- uh, Je- Je- what's his name? Jeffrey Epstein. I can't believe I almost said Jerry Epstein. That's a, it's amazing. They managed to memory hole that guy so well that I almost forgot his first name. But, you know, you've got that scandal. There were all the scandals in the 90s with uh, Prince Charles and Diana. Uh, William and Catherine seem to be really dignified. And I, I, th- I think if the British monarchy is able to survive, it, it will be because of that. And this is really something to look for, I think, just even in our own personal lives here. Catherine is Bay, all right. Catherine, people like people like her. They like her more than they like Meghan Markle because Meghan Markle is not dignified at all. She's extremely undignified. <laughs> and this woman, this woman, after people have been suggesting that you know her husband is cheating on her, and they're suggesting that she's dead, and they've been suggesting all these terrible things, she comes and she's, thank you so much for all your cares and concerns. Thank you. It's, that's really dignified behavior, and that's very attractive, especially in an age that is extremely undignified, and downright shameless. So we pray for her recovery, and perhaps we ought to try to emulate a little bit of that uh, grace and dignity. Speaking of the British Commonwealth, uh, Justin Trudeau, reputed child of Fidel Castro, though I actually don't believe that theory, uh, Trudeau is now threatening to cut off Canadian arms sales to Israel. This is a story from last week, but I really wanted to get to it. Uh, Canada's arms exports to Israel are pretty much immaterial that compared to the U.S., which funds 6.5% of the Israeli military. Uh, Canada's arms sales don't, don't really matter all that much. It amounts to less than $90 million bucks over the last nine years. Um, but nevertheless, this is a, a PR loss for the Israeli state, and you're probably going to see more of this from around the world. Why is it? Well, Justin Trudeau is pretty liberal, and... Uh, support for the state of Israel has declined broadly, but especially among leftists, it has declined. This was only a matter of time before the Trudeau government did something like this. Other governments certainly will follow. This is the the direction that the left is headed. And it's a, a reminder for the American right, this is a good wedge issue. They're always trying to get us on wedge issues. For instance, the the left was trying to get the right to make IVF the top issue in the 2024 election some weeks ago because the American right is just split on it. I mean, you see this even among the elected politicians. Some view IVF as bioethically uh, unacceptable because it, practically speaking, usually results in a lot of abortion and just as a as a basic matter undercuts so many of the other conservative arguments about the sanctity of life and life beginning at conception and all the rest of it. It undercuts the family. It promotes all sorts of deviant uh, behaviors and relationships, and it just has a lot of problems. But then other people on the right say, hey, look, if a couple struggles with fertility, then they should have this option to be able to go to the baby store you know, with some doctor and and give the doctor six figures and then be able to to make a baby. And I'm, I'm being uh, somewhat uncharitable to that view, but it's a very popular view. It's actually probably the predominant view on the right. So the, the libs were just bashing us with this issue for a while. Well, the Israel issue is a good one to hit them with because the elite libs, the, the leading libs in the political establishment are very pro-Israel. Uh, the more left-wing libs and the base libs are very anti-Israel. And as this war continues to go on, this war has been going on since October of 2023, uh, th- that, that tension is going to get even even tougher. Uh, so n- not a bad issue for the Republicans to point to in 2024. Speaking of the left, a, n- a new sexuality has dropped. Even since I had Wayne Brady explain to us pansexualism, there's, there is now a new sexuality, a new identity group. That, of course, would be eco-sexuality. Libs, take it away. Hey everyone, my name's Georgia. I'm Normal's in-house sex coach. And today I want to speak about 
ecosexuality. This is an umbrella term for people who treat nature as a central partner or something that they want to protect and celebrate rather than a resource that they want to exploit. How a person actually practices and expresses their ecosexuality is completely up to them and often it will be quite unique. Whilst it's certainly not new, I'm hearing of more and more people interested in this identity or this expression. For some people, it might mean they feel erotically charged by having their feet on the ground and breathing, becoming aware of how their body feels to be present with the earth. Others, it may be actually touching, exploring food and nature, feeling the textures and sensations. For other people, it might mean having sex outdoors. And for others, it may actually mean that they're literally having sex with the earth. Lover earth, not mother earth. Am I right? So however you like to explore it, do some research. Explore whether it's exciting for you and smell a few flowers. The tone of her voice does not match what she's saying. Though this is the perfect impression of NPR or PBS, you know, where the libs say all sorts of egregious, ridiculous things. But they say them, you know, in a really calm voice. We're going to uh, arrest Donald Trump and all of his supporters. Uh, We're going to take away all of your property. We're going to skin you alive and we're going to throw your uh, balls of flesh, uh, your just crumpled masses of humanity into a gulag until the dogs eat you. Uh, Please uh, be sure to donate now and we'll send you a tote bag. That's kind of what this woman's doing. Saying, yes, you know, look, eco-sexuality can mean you like nature. It can mean that you... Enjoy going for a walk in your garden. And it can mean that you feel a little, you know, a little special when you're out at the beach. Or, and it could also mean that you um, copulate with the ground. Wait, huh? You know, like a, like, a, like a mole hole or something like that, you know, in the middle of your median or something. Uh, yes, very, very weird and very gross. She does beat Wayne Brady, though, because Wayne Brady says... I'm a pansexual, and that means I can be attracted. I can love anyone here. And what this woman's saying is, oh, yeah? Well, checkmate, sir. I'm an ecosexual, and I can love anything here. Not just, you've limited. You're so closed-minded, Wayne Brady and pansexuals. You've limited your attraction to the set of people. But uh, mine is so much bigger because I can love trees. What does this mean? When the woman started out her explanation, it sounded to me like she was just describing an, a normal thing, which is people like going to the beach, people like nature. Then it seemed to get into something a little, little more intense. What ecosexuality can mean is really one of two things. It can either be nature worship, actual pagan nature worship, like fetishism, The term fetish is used today, but fetish refers specifically to a pagan idol that you worship. And uh, there's a connection between these things. We we read about ancient paganism and we we think that, you know, they were all, because we impose our own religious experience onto it, we think they were all kind of orderly and nice and just bowing down to a statue or something. No, they were having crazy orgies and killing people and getting extremely drunk and doing drugs and just, it's nuts, you know. Uh, it It was much more Woodstock than you know, going to some kind of a church on Sunday. Uh, So it could be that. It could be a a really extreme form of nature worship, which pagan societies have done for all of history. Or, I mean, that would be disturbing enough because it would mean we're a post-Christian society. We're just reverting to paganism as apostates. But almost more depressing, I think what this ecosexuality thing might largely come down to is a conflation of all relations, all attractions, all desires into sex. And you see this all around today. People aren't allowed to have friends anymore. If, especially men. If, if two men talk about anything other than football, if two men uh, have any kind of a deep friendship, it's, it's called gay, either jokingly or, or seriously. And even if the guys, you know, the guys like girls, the guys are not, they don't like each other in that way, but they like each other. Women, if women have too close a friendship, now it's just called lesbian. 
It, but obviously, we have loves and desires and attractions that are not sexual. At least we used to be able to do that. I certainly have that. I love my family. <laughs> you know, I love my Aunt Betty. Uh, I don't love her like that. <laughs> you know, I love my children. I don't, but I love my wife very differently than I love my children or the rest of my family. I love my friends. I love my friends very differently than I love my wife. I love nature. I like taking long walks on the beach too. I don't love the beach like I love my wife. Uh, what modern liberalism has done though is just bring everything down, not even to the level of the erotic because erotic love can be ennobling and inspiring and lead us to the ultimate, the source and summit of all of our loves, who is God. I mean, that's what the divine comedy is all about. Dante loves this woman, Beatrice, not even his wife, and she leads him up to God. Uh, but but it's even worse than that because it, it's it's not even just erotic. It's just this kind of material, just like sex. You just like, you just do sex. You know, you're just bumping uglies all the time. <laughs> that's, that's basically that's what all of our loves are. Our friendships, our professional relationships, our familial relationships, and including our, our romantic and, uh, and erotic relationships. All just boils down to that. And no wonder people are now stopping the earth. The Divided States of Biden with Ben Shapiro has its second episode out. It's focused on how fentanyl has become America's silent epidemic. Many know what fentanyl is, but do you know that it's the number one killer of adults ages 18 to 49, claiming an average of 295 lives per day, and that the Biden administration is completely silent? In fact, Joe Biden's policies make it easier for fentanyl to be distributed and sold around the country, allowing it to fall into the hands of any American, many of them very young. Ben Shapiro uncovers the fentanyl crisis in one of the most affected cities in the latest episode of The Divided States of Biden. Watch The Divided States of Biden, Fentanyl, America's Silent Epidemic, now exclusively on Daily Wire Plus. My favorite comment yesterday is from Char Bar, who says, I had a childhood stutter that went away in my late teens, spent several years in speech therapy where the therapist would tell me about all the famous people who had a childhood stutter, and none of them ever mentioned Senator Joe Biden. I know it's so... So offensive that the, it's, it's maybe the worst gaslighting. It's the worst kind of um, obvious lie that makes us all think we're crazy that they tell about Biden. Joe Biden has been a, a very public person for 50 years. The guy entered the Senate in 1972 and we've all heard him a million times. He never stops talking. None of us have ever heard him stutter but because he's in cognitive decline and he can't speak very well right now, they told us in 2020, they said, ah, yes, it's a result of Joe Biden's childhood stutter that we've all heard him ha suffer from for all of his life. We all have. Oceania has always been at war with East Asia. And I kid you not, I have Democrat friends, relatives who are of a certain age, you know, been around for a long time, and I said, this is totally crazy, this Biden stutter thing. They said, no, 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 actually, apparently, according to the news reports, he's always had it. But you know he hasn't. <laughs> You've heard him. He was the vice president for eight years, and he was a U.S. senator for the latter part of the 20th century into the early 21st century. You know, no, we don't know. No, no, these are not the droids we're looking for. Okay, speaking of crazy people, John Hinckley Jr., for the younger listeners, this is a name you might not have heard of before. He's the man who tried to kill Ronald Reagan and who, who ultimately is guilty of murdering Reagan's press secretary, uh, James Brady, uh, even though he just severely paralyzed him. And then, But I think on, on Brady's uh, death certificate, it says co complications of being shot, you know, after some years. Uh, a guy, a total nut, uh, he was sent to a mental institution because he was able to claim insanity. And actually, after that judgment, which many people thought was unjust, it became a lot harder to plead uh, not guilty for reason of insanity. Uh, but, but he was in this loony bin for much of his life. And then he was just kind of released. And it was, I felt extremely outrageous and unjust for him to be released. But it barely even made a splash. People kind of forgot. They moved on. We live in a, a very anti-prison age, and the libs and the establishment hate Reagan anyway. So <laughs> some of them probably wish that uh, Hinckley had succeeded. So they let him out. And what is Hinckley doing? He's a musician now. Hinckley has been trying to play venues. He's tried to become a singer. He's 68 years old. So he's, he's really, I mean, he committed this crime at a very young age. Uh, 
but, but a lot of the venues don't want to have him. So now the man who tried to murder President Reagan is claiming to be a victim of cancel culture. <laughs> Here's what he says. He says, I think that's fair to say. I'm a victim of cancel culture. It keeps happening over and over again. They book me, and then the show gets announced, and then the venue starts getting backlash. The owners always cave. They cancel. It's happened so many times. It's kind of what I expect. I don't really get upset. That's, that's big of him. He doesn't get upset. I'm just caught up in the cancel culture, I guess. It would be a venue for new artists, distinguished artists, and they'd get, they wouldn't get canceled at the last minute, but I'm getting canceled. Yeah. I think the phrase cancel culture, I think we have to retire it. <laughs> if, if a man is complaining about being canceled after trying to murder the very popular president, then I don't think cancel culture means all that much anymore. You'll remember at a time when the right really embraced this phrase, everyone was just constantly, we, we need to cancel cancel culture. Cancel culture is terrible. I, <laughs> in typically contrarian fashion, while everyone was zigging, I zagged on that issue, not just to be a contrarian, but because it just wasn't my view of free speech. I, and I wrote a whole book called Speechless about this, available now, you, thank you. Uh, you can get it wherever fine books are sold, which, which said the issue isn't cancel culture because all cultures cancel because all cultures have standards and norms and taboos. So if we're in, suddenly inveighing against standards and norms, for goodness sakes, are, are we conservatives? I thought conservatives were the people with standards. I thought we were the people who said, actually, you know, certain behaviors are kind of off limits. Actually, guys, let's have a little self-respect. Let's live in a, a serious, flourishing country. Let's not just behave like animals, okay? No, we cancel culture, I wouldn't even say it's good. It's just that's how, that is what culture is, right? Culture is known by its limits, just like a, a nation is known by its geographical limit. A culture is known by its limits of taboo, and that's just the way it goes, and that's a good thing. We need to just set good standards, not not dumb standards like the libs do today. Uh, but but if now, as I guess was inevitable, if if a man is arguing that murdering the president should be within the acceptable bounds of society. <laughs> that he shouldn't be canceled. What, just because I tried to murder the guy who won 49 states, maybe 50 states in 1984? What, just because of that, I'm going to get canceled? I thought, oh, so I thought this was the party of free speech. Uh, I guess we're not. I don't know. I guess that's my limit, I guess. You murder the president, that's it. Uh, we need to hang that up. We need to hang that up. I think it's perfectly fine to cancel John Hinckley Jr. Speaking of career changes, before we go, I wanted to leave you with a little terrible news. Uh, Representative Mike Gallagher is resigning from Congress. Now, Mike Gallagher, kind of a squish, but I, I haven't even followed him all that closely. He voted against impeaching Alejandro Mayorkas, the worst Homeland Security Secretary ever. Uh, uh, that vote alone, you know, I think earns him the epithet squish. Uh, he's leaving. He's a Republican from Wisconsin. And he's not even going to wait until the end of his term. This is the problem. It'd be one thing if he were waiting until the end of his term and then just sort of quietly went away and were replaced by some other Republican who was about the same or maybe even more conservative. Who knows? But he's not doing that. He is leaving Congress now, which means that the Republicans will have effectively a one-vote majority in Congress. It's not technically a one-vote majority. It will be... 20, 217 to 213. 217 Republicans, 213 Democrats. So you say, no, they got a four-vote majority, right? No, they don't. Because if one guy flips, all of a sudden, it's 216 to 214. Which means you can't afford to lose enough. You can now afford to lose one squish vote on conservative legislation in the House. But don't forget, the Republican Party has a lot of squishes. This, this is why I couldn't get so angry at Nikki Haley when during her presidential campaign, she made a decision to appeal directly to the libs and the squishes and the centrists. I, I felt it was actually kind of a smart thing to do for her campaign because she was never going to win in the Trump lane. She was never going to win in the conservative lane. That was already taken. So she appealed to the squishes. And I said, look, she has every right to stay in the race because there are a lot of more establishment type Republicans in the party. I'm not saying it's enough to win, but call it a quarter of the party or something. And she's catering to them. Well, that's represented in the House, too. You think that Republicans are going to be able to maintain the unity such that only one 
guy can switch over to the Democrats. That, not possible. Not possible. So with the, the resignation of Mike Gallagher, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I can tell, the Republicans have just practically lost their majority in the House. It's not that the Democrats have a majority in the House now. The Republicans can still kind of gum things up because they'll have the leadership technically, but it's over. And how did we get here? Well, we got here because Republicans stupidly kicked out George Santos, you know, the kind of wacky guy from Long Island. I'm not saying Santos was uh, great or even deserved re-election, but to boot him out midterm, that really hit your majority. And then you had resignations, and now you've got more scandals cropping up as the election comes, and now you got people just dropping out. Ken Buck just resigning midterm so that he can spite Lauren Boebert, a, a, a more conservative member, but she's seems weaker because she's had all these PR scandals. So, okay, there goes another vote for the majority. And now Mike Gallagher's out. There it is. Leave it to the Republicans in an election year to clutch defeat from the jaws of victory. It raises the stakes all the more for 2024. We're all focused on the presidential race in 2024, rightly so. You got Cinema, Kirsten Cinema, resigning in Arizona. She is a Democrat who's kind of independent. All of a sudden, now the Senate is up for grabs. Now you got Gallagher out in the House. All of a sudden, the House majority has evaporated. Now the House is going to be a major, major playing field. Everything's up in 2024. Whether you're feeling good about the race or whether you're feeling bad about it, pretty much the whole government is up for grabs. The rest of the show continues now. You don't want to miss it. It's Music Monday, baby. Become a member. Use code Knowles, Canada BLES, at checkout for two months free on all annual plans. Bye. <laughs>